Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of Exploring Kodawari. Our guest for this episode was trumpet player Chris Coletti. Chris is well known in the music world for many accomplishments, most notably for playing in the famous Canadian Brass from 2009 to 2019. More recently, Chris was appointed an assistant professor at Ithaca College School of Music. I first met Chris a few years ago when we played a Baroque opera together, and besides him being amazing at trumpet, he was also really knowledgeable about other geeky topics like space, math, physics, and those types of things that I also love talking about. And since this podcast is all about the Kodawari approach to life, aka approaching everything in life with detailed curiosity and always trying to grow and learn new things, Chris was a really great guest. He has the Kodawari energy not only with trumpet, but with tons of other topics as well. We talked about trumpet, performing, and teaching, but also about telescopes, stargazing, astrophysics, quantum mechanics, consciousness, specialty coffee, and plenty of other topics that we've each gone down the respective rabbit holes of. So to our music and trumpet player listeners, you'll have to excuse the fact that we wandered in and out of actually talking about trumpet, but that was pretty much by design. We did geek out more about trumpet stuff in part two. I separated the conversation into two parts. So be sure to look out for that episode next week and follow us on social media to see short clips we post each week as well. If you like what we're doing on the podcast and blog, please consider sharing it with friends or leaving a review in your podcasting app. And if you really want to support us, consider heading over to our website to make a donation through PayPal. Links for that are in the episode notes. Thanks to Chris for coming on and having such a fun conversation. Thanks to you all for listening and enjoy the episode. All right. Well, Chris Coletti, welcome to Exploring Kodawari. It is my honor. Thank you for having me. <laughs> uh, I already introduced you a little bit in the intro, you know, basic bio stuff. So can you just tell a more personal, um, you know, story who you are? What, you're, what you've been up to, that kind of stuff? Yeah, sure. So um, for those of you that don't know, I'm a trumpet player. Um, hopefully one day I'll be famous for something really random. But <laughs> so far, people know me for playing in Canadian brass for 10 years. Random by some people's standards. <laughs> uh, right. You're good. I, wanted, like, I just want my logo projected on the moon at one point in my oh, career. I want that to be like one of the important milestones. But the problem is I don't have a logo. You see it? So there's right. a lot to have... Well, that's Step one. <laughs> right. Um, and now I teach trumpet at Ithaca College. And this is my, uh, yeah, I started in 2018. And it's an amazing transition that I've been making. And I have two kids. And I'm married. And so I'm in really enjoying family life. Uh -huh. And so for those of you that saw me in concert, I look totally different. I've got a beard to my feet. I'm like <laughs> Dave Letterman. No, that's not true. <laughs> So did you um, kind of have to stop Canadian Brass when, when Ithaca came to be? Or was it was it like just too much to juggle those two jobs? Or That was a lot. But really, if I didn't have kids, it would have been doable. Right, right. Um, but crazy, for sure. Um, it was crazy doing both um, for a year or a little about. And it was a, it was a one-year position. So in a way, it was high stakes. But in a way, it was less so because I... You know, I wanted to see if I liked it, so I, I sure. kind of felt like I was auditioning the I, the the con the concept of teaching full time, right? And um, but I loved it, and I loved the area. I really fell in love with the city and the, having students that were you know, I saw kind of all the time, and not just because I had been teaching for years, but it felt a little different than conservatory, which is where I went, mm -hmm. and um, also it felt different teaching adjunct. Right. Also, at a conservatory, usually teachers are adjunct. So it was just a little different. It was a little bit more involved, and I really liked that. And I liked having an office. It was like all these – it was so different. <laughs> yeah. And having a house and all that. And so – Just more I, settled I, probably, right? Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I, that sounded like a bad word when I was living in the city, but I really <laughs> – I think it's, the yeah. timing was perfect. So – I mean, settled yeah, so, almost has the feeling of like complacency, but it, it just means that – yeah. <laughs> then the things that didn't tire you out 10 years ago start to tire you out probably. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I didn't feel tired, but, but I do remember being on tour. Um, so the Christmas season for Canadian brass is it's always crazy. And it was just as crazy as always. And it was crazy. It's great. Right. If you concert every night, that's just more efficient than, yeah. you know, flying home every, all the time. So we would just, you know, fly from one city, play a concert, fly to the next city, play a concert every day, almost every day for, you know, the day after Thanksgiving until just about until Christmas. Yeah. And but when I had the teaching job and I had, you know, juries and I had lessons and I had a kid 
and my wife was pregnant and I was living in a city that had an airport that only has three flights going into it a day. Oh gosh. It was yeah. crazy. And so I had three days between Thanksgiving and Christmas that I could go home to teach all of my 15 students and see my family three times. Yeah. And I had to teach all of their lessons and do juries on the last one. And it was like the fact that the flights worked out, it was snowing, you know, we get like eight feet of snow. It was completely madness. I don't know how it worked out, but I, I that was the first time <laughs> in my life that I was like, I can't do this. Like right. I actually can't do it. You're and one I know canceled that, flight away from the whole thing crumbling. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like missing the concert, missing yeah. school, missing, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, and so yeah, Canadian brass has always had really amazing flight karma, like knock on wood. There was only one time in 50 years that somebody missed a concert because of a flight issue. And yeah. Was I mean, I suppose if you're flying every day, that's bound to happen. I'm surprised it only happened once. Only once. And the, yeah, and then there was another that was close, but we wound up getting a private plane that was extremely expensive and probably not worth it, but we did it. Uh-huh. <laughs> That's fun, though. <laughs> yeah, I've never been cool. on a private plane. <laughs> However, it's not better. It's just cooler. Just right. like touch screens. Yeah, touch yeah, screens yeah. are not an improvement. It's just cooler. And <laughs> right, right. cooler is apparently enough to completely change the world, but there's nothing better about it. You have to look at it to see it. When you're driving a touch screen in your car, and trust me, I still want a Tesla. Yeah. <laughs> You need to see the screen. You need to be looking at it. On a radio, you feel your way around the buttons. It's very frustrating. Oh, and, interesting, yeah, yeah. You know, and a private plane, especially because the buttons could be, you know, remapped for whatever, depending on the screen you're looking at. Yeah. And a private plane doesn't have a bathroom, unless you have a private giant jet, which this was not. <laughs> oh, interesting. I never so, thought about that detail. What do people do? Yeah. They wait. They wait. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, I tried to there's wait. There's two choices. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was really hard. <laughs> So I guess you probably wouldn't even take a small private plane on a long, long trip anyways, because you don't have the room for the fuel or the power to carry that much fuel. Right. Yeah. Like the rocket flew. equation, half of your power goes into carrying fuel. <laughs> yeah. More than half. Yeah. Yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Way more. Yeah. They like, think about, especially a spaceship where, yeah, you know, like the, the capsule with people in it is, I mean. The smallest you, part on the top. Yeah. Yeah. It's this like <laughs> tiny little thing. It's like, come on, guys, you got, you got enough fuel to blast us to the moon. You're going to, I got to. Yeah. Three guys were all crammed into this. That's what must be terrifying about being an astronaut is you know how much explosives is directly underneath your back, you know? Everything they've got. That's what they've got behind. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Hydrogen and oxygen, and (laughs) they're just waiting to mix. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah, crazy. (laughs) So I think um, we ask this to every guest, but um, how has, like, coronavirus affected you personally and professionally nowadays? Well, the first freaky thing was that suddenly, you know, major portion of my income was gone because there were no concerts. Yeah. And so I'm fortunate that I have a teaching job, but I, I, I you know, never, ima- I just never planned for it to be the only thing that I had going on. So that's yeah. my own fault. But I don't think anybody really planned for something to have their entire lives completely come to a halt. Yeah. But, um, but I was fortunate that I had like kind of an online presence already that I had been working on kind of in the back of my mind as a worst case scenario. So I... I took that, I, I was, in my, when I was doing all those things before coronavirus, I always felt like I was wondering if I was taking too much time to do it. Right. And, but I always sort of secretly was like, man, I really wish there was something that would kick me in the butt to like take this stuff seriously because it's so cool when you meet, like I have a cousin that is very famous and very wealthy for creating like all these online courses and stuff. And like mm-hmm. the whole, his niche isn't what I would, was interested in doing myself. Although it's very useful stuff about marketing and what have you. I just love, I was like, that's really cool. Like, Cause he's yeah. literally, it's the coolest business ever is to create something and you could sell one and you're, it's like, yay, it worked. And you could sell a bazillion and it's the same amount of work, right? It's yeah. scalable. And that's so the scalable. thing I always yeah. hated about music. You know, and But that I was torn though, cause I loved it. I wanted more concerts. So it wasn't like I was trying to outsource. So yeah, that was a big change. <laughs> Yeah. And um and but it was and it was also a big change cuz suddenly I was like at a computer even more trying to like scale that up because I had to. Right. And then um and then it became, you know, it's a little stressful because I'm not sure how uh yeah, like when when universities and like start going out of business, that's freaky. I mean, I I think I'm lucky to be where I am, but it's I don't think it's that anything anyone is immune to, yeah. you know, yeah. being starved out completely. If this COVID thing revealed anything, it's how um, um, delicately the economy is built, including universities. Like they probably, so many 
charge full tuition and they're all online and there's a lot of complaints about that as there should be, but also they would go out of business in one semester without, you know, the people paying full tuition, especially students. overseas students and stuff. Yeah, no, you're right. Uh, it's a, it's a tough model. And, um, and obviously I think it's a tremendously valuable thing. Anyone that's gone to a good school knows that, but, um, but it is an expensive process. Yeah, it's expensive. So yeah, I don't know what will change, but, and I, I don't think there's anything surprising going on. It's just accelerated. And that's the, the part that's been surprising yeah. for everybody. Like the so, automation thing with um, jobs being lost to automation, they were looking at before this, a 10 year, 15 year time scale. And already that's been like, oh, well, we already fired all these workers. We might as well implement that automation factor now while it's yeah. like no one's working anyway. So yeah, that's a good point. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, I, I do think a lot of good will come of it. Um, obviously, the worst case scenario would be if it turns out to be like one of those viruses, like a virus like that like doesn't... Like the start of a movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Like one but of us turns are... into a zombie mid-podcast. <laughs> <laughs> right. I remember an old Nickelodeon show, Are You Afraid of the Dark? Remember oh, that? yeah. I know that one, yeah. Did you watch that in Turkish? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah? They had oh, a Turkish so... version of it, yeah. Oh, I'm so relieved to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I could see that being a, a, a thing. I mean, certainly in the beginning of COVID, my like anxiety mind was like, well, they were too stupid to see this coming, I guess. So like, how do they know what's going on? Like, what is it? Like, I, I, I'm not a micro, any virologist, biologist, anything. Like, like, I don't know how, you know, fern sites and RNA stuff work. So I'm just going to assume the worst and just not really see anybody. And right. now it's like we started teaching in person uh, just this week because the schools here opened. Yeah. Oh, right. So you didn't really have a choice. It's like, hey, do you want 15 students today <laughs> or do you want me to give them to someone else? It's like, no, I'll take them. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, yeah. So what are you doing? Do you have like masks with zippers and stuff? I've seen, <laughs> so, I taught one lesson like that. <laughs> so some of my students are piano. That's easy. And yeah. they set up like in each room, two pianos with a plastic divider. Mm. And then for trumpet, you just, I take my mask off and, um, you know, it's in a pretty big room uh, okay. with a plastic a divider and it makes it a little bit harder to see like their band music or whatever. You I don't have a telescope? Of, I don't have a telescope <laughs> in my trumpet case. Not that that would really help in a, <laughs> in a room. <laughs> well, you could zoom. I thought you were like, look at their embouchure. I guess that's a little bizarre. Oh yeah. That'd be weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I saw an Instagram video of yours. You have a telescope, right? You were looking at the moon yeah. or something? Yeah. Yeah, I have two telescopes. I, well, so I was a like, wedding gift. My wife's best friend got us one. And I didn't really know. My experience with telescopes was that we went on our on a date in Hawaii. I mean, it sounds really, I mean, it, was, it wasn't as lavish as it sounds, but we had a concert there. So we got to go to Hawaii, which was amazing. Yeah. And we went on this, uh, this astronomy tour. And it was just an amateur astronomer, but she, I mean, she really knew her stuff. And she took out this, this telescope on the top of the mountain in uh, Maui. I forget what it's called. It's where those famous telescopes are, which is like the adjacent mountain. But oh, okay. You could drive Same like the general other. elevation, like above yeah. the clouds and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You could see that. You're like looking across oh, the cool. valley and that's the other, the, like the huge telescopes. And it's yeah. amazing because it's like something like 11,000 feet. Yeah. You're above the clouds. It is, you know, it was, you know, it's why it was like 80 degrees all the time. Perfect. No, you know, all, all that. Yeah. And it was freezing 33 degrees up there she had winter jackets and stuff and and meanwhile it was perfect when the sun was up and so it was exquisite yeah and her her telescope was this ginormous thing and in my mind i was like i'm buying this thing it's probably fifty thousand dollars i'm just gonna <laughs> save up i'm doing it and then i found out that it's like 1200 bucks which was kind of a lot for a telescope but <clears throat> my wife wound up buying me one for christmas and that's nice. the one in the picture and it's amazing. It's huge. I mean, it's like bigger than I am. Oh, gosh. So you could, <clears throat> yeah, you can, it's amazing how far optics have gone. And, you know, you can get, you know, what, looking at an, an object, like something like Saturn, yeah. with the, the, the guy that discovered it didn't get to see it, like you, the way you could I see know, it, 1200 yeah. bucks. That's yeah. <laughs> amazing. To me. That's crazy. Yeah, my uncle has a telescope and we, we went over when there was a good night where you had Venus, Saturn, and um, 
Jupiter out at the same time. Oh. And so we we did Venus first, and you can actually see Venus has phases just like the moon does, right? Yes, that's mind-boggling, right? It's like just a point of light in the sky, but then you zoom in on it, you're like, whoa, yes. there's more going on here. <laughs> yeah, and apparently that was actually one of the first pieces of evidence that the Earth was round. Right, because it casts a shadow, you know, a sphere casts a curved shadow, exactly, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Not that I would have exactly. figured that out. I would have been like, hey, cool, a curved shadow. <laughs> oh, right, right. And but then it is to see worth, the rings of Saturn, that's so that crazy. Is, yeah. yeah, that that never, yeah, that is by far the coolest thing to see. Yeah. You see I that space that, in between the sphere of the planet, and yes. if you get the right angle, the ring, and you can see through, yeah, it's pretty crazy. And the it moons, is, I'm sure you, you probably caught at least one of the moons of something. Yeah, like you could see Titan the or four, whatever. like, I never really gotten to see Saturn moons, but yeah, you can see the four like Galilean moons of Jupiter really yeah. well. And Jupiter's got is also like that where you could see the, the bands of of storms and crazy. Yeah, it's just amazing to see. And I remember when in my Canadian brass days, you know, it was a very small telescope. It was really more for like looking at boats across the water uh -huh. and looking through it right before we were like, they were in the car about to leave. And I was like, that was the first time I ever got to see Jupiter's moons. And I didn't know what they were. I just, they were just dot. They were kind of like yeah. oddly lined up. Right, like, right, right. Yeah. No way. And and they were so pissed because they, it was late. They were trying to go home. Got but yeah, was, some people aren't aren't struck with that as much, but <laughs> I just yeah. like get frozen. I'm like, wait a second. I'm seeing photons that traveled from the sun, yes. bounced off of this moon of Jupiter, traveled back, and it took like um i think it's eight minutes eight minutes something well eight so, minutes to the sun from here to the sun from here so probably it's more like like a 45 minute round trip when you're seeing a moon of of jupiter or something oh, a moon right which and this is another cool thing I and mean, you probably know this but like but one of the first pieces of evidence that light ha actually had a speed was was discovered from watching jupiter's moons through a telescope because they, oh, one, I, I once, guess I don't know this story then. Oh, re okay. Yeah. So once, and I know like the short version, but once Jupiter, uh, once, I'm um, sorry, calculus was invented, they were able to predict where the moons should be and when, mm -hmm. and when certain, you know, at, at, at times of the year when they're, when the moons are in the furthest part of Jupiter and versus when they're the closest, they were off by a certain amount of time. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. And it was like, that was what they, they were like, well, that's strange. Like what could explain that? Yeah. And you know, unless the math was wrong and it turns out the math was right, but it's just that light took however. And I thought it was, I thought it was a similar distance to the sun, but I, I guess I don't really know. Yeah. I, I, I used to, I, so basically I was really, I think at the time we first met, I was in my like prime time, like astrophysics, you know, that was my nice. uh, rabbit hole. And now yeah. it's kind of gone more into like the psychology consciousness, oh, like kind of stuff. Fascinating. Who knows what it'll be next. It also right. became like coffee for a while and like <laughs> cocktails and whatever else comes across, the, you know. I love this. I yeah. had similar, yeah, I went through the coffee thing too. So what's, oh, yeah? how have do you, you gone down coffee? the coffee rabbit hole? I did. I, I'm kind of out of it, but like, yeah, but I have my, you know, I'm, I'm just as into it. I'm just not as fancy with my, my gear. Uh huh. So how but, far did you go? Were you like buying espresso machine level or? I have an espresso machine. I never went for like one of the like seven thousand dollar ones. The La Marzocco, like, <laughs> like the La Marzocco. Yeah, I never went there, but um, I forget the one Caleb bought. Caleb got really into it. Caleb Hudson, and then yeah. wound up doing that. I and I, I think I got. I forget that I'm actually forgetting the brand of it because I haven't been using it as much because my mornings are a little more hectic now. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but I, I got into AeroPress because when I was in, oh, yeah. so I was interviewing all these baristas and I would take their picture and get a quote from them and. Me and the other Canadian brass guys started this like hashtag co uh, co coffee quotes or something. I forget what it was actually. There's a few. Uh -huh. And but we were the idea was to like photograph their coffee, them working with it, and something they had to say about life or whatever. And my favorite was coffee is my cup of tea. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and but when I asked them all what they did at home, I'm like you sure do you just wait till you come to work or like you you certainly don't have this at home. And I think one did, but they almost all said they had AeroPresses. Yeah. So I went to buy an AeroPress like thirty bucks, and it's amazing. Yeah, I have an AeroPress. Um, nice. So my favorite thing to do with the AeroPress now, uh, do you don't? Know, there's an actual AeroPress championship every year. I do know. About this. So you can <laughs> so go on cool. and like look up the winning recipes. Now here, I, oh, my okay. friend um, sent me down the rabbit hole yet another further click. He bought me the AeroPress dice. This cool. um, I forget the company, but they made these dice. There's um, basically bloom time inverted there's one dice that says are you doing it inverted right side up whatever 
There's one that says bloom time, one that says dose, and one that says water temp. And if you're trying to just be experimental with a coffee, you roll the die and you just see what you get that morning and try something out. That's beautiful. Have you ever done the inverted AeroPress? I've done the inverted. It's yeah. a little dangerous. Is it? I mean, well, you can... I guess you're teetering on the, the the tension of the rubber seal. That's what I mean. And if you flip <laughs> it too haphazardly, it it. So one time I I messed up the inversion one and I just got the coffee slurry burning all over my hand. Yeah, and you it... know what? I did burn myself, and you're right. It was the inversion, but I think it's because I didn't have a good pour at the time. Oh, okay. I finally got like a gooseneck. Tea oh yeah, yeah, those are key. The gooseneck it kettle. Huge... Yeah, it's so pleasant. Oh, it's like meditative when you're pouring. It you is know, very. I went. To... We went to this restaurant in China once and the it was so cool because in China they have these enormous tables with a with a you know what we call a lazy susan in the middle that's just like uh-huh. all Chinese restaurants in China have those yeah. fancy and not fancy and it's really convenient because they have these huge meals but anyway so it's a pain for the server to get you tea and so they had these tea cups with this gooseneck that was like literally 13 feet long oh my god and we just like all of a sudden there's like this razor sharp <laughs> boiling hot thing perfect pour of tea and you see them coming and around it's quiet it was, too it's like when a yeah. prius is pulling up behind you you know <laughs> or right. a tesla but with a joust coming out of the front yeah yeah <laughs> they make such fancy ones too so i just have a uh bona vita like kettle and uh-huh. now it actually leaks because i i traveled with it so much that the gooseneck <laughs> seal the just kind of came off or whatever i love that you travel with a kettle though that's just great <laughs> i mean i did until like enough people said like what are you doing like i would have a bag with my grinder i have like a, a virtuoso right. barazza virtuoso and it was like a full trader joe size bag of stuff <laughs> but one pair of underwear yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Not enough clothes. Just no in towels. Case you have to make coffee with a sock, you know, in case all that stuff breaks. Hey, that's a method of brewing, right? They basically that's pour it right. through that. Um, I forget what it's called or whatever, but which I discounted fully until I started until I saw Francis Malman make an incredible cup of coffee with that. And then, do you know this guy? I don't think so. He, he he's he, if you've ever gotten to one of those those cooking shows, I think it's I forget the name of it. There's, there's some that are more. This this particular one, it's I think it might might be mine of a chef. It's like okay. they're really beautiful. It has the Richter Vivaldi, you know that recomposed Vivaldi album oh, that Richter yeah. did. That's the theme music. Amazing. Okay. And it's and it takes on that same level of seriousness in the in the episodes. But anyway, Francis Malman is this uh, amazing chef that is um, he cooks with fire in these traditional. Oh, shoot, I'm forgetting where he's from. In South America. Anyway, it's very important, but it doesn't matter for now. But he, <laughs> the, the seven fires version of cooking, and it's like wild to see him because on one hand, it's like as polished as you can imagine a chef being. Yeah. But on the other hand, it's like there's this carcass like on a stake, it's like six sure, feet yeah, from yeah. a fire. And he's like splashing water at it from a distance. And he makes this breakfast in the morning, coffee in an old nasty old sock. And then he <laughs> takes the coffee grounds and smothers bacon in it. Oh. And, and cooks that like the old coffee grounds yeah so a scene I, i've done that with steak goes, before have you ever oh, like yeah yeah, yeah. I done it. Comes okay, out great. so that's a thing yeah I, although All i right. didn't use spent coffee grounds i'm pretty sure we used like just ground I fresh coffee so, yeah. oh man so you must have been amped after eating that yeah, the steak plus the caffeine. You're just like life is all right. <laughs> <laughs> right, a little bit of a little oil on there. Yep. Um well my friend Kevin um, he oh, basically okay. taught me the reverse sear for steak. Mm-hmm. And so if you buy like a, a thick enough steak, you go in the oven for about, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes at a, at a certain temperature. And then oh. you just sear it at the end on the outside. And he likes to sear it in duck fat. Oh, so wow. it's just, yeah, it's That's ridiculous. <laughs> and the rule is if the smoke alarm doesn't go off, you didn't do it right. <laughs> <laughs> So you have to you have to have the smoke alarm go off and get that chaotic moment of like oh the God. garlic, the duck fat, you know, the rosemary you threw in there, and then it all happens very fast. And then you can eat it right away too because you don't have to rest a steak if you've already oh, heated man. it up in this reverse sear method. Oh, that's very cool. It's almost like sous vide. I guess sous vide is similar. It's basically a sous vide version when you don't have sous vide. Although you right. can also do sous vide in a cooler if you just get boiling water. And right. just keep checking the temperature, add more boiling water to keep the temperature stable. We did an elk steak like that. It came out amazing mm-hmm. on 4th of July, I think. Mm-hmm. Was it a vegan elk steak or was it a real one? Uh, no, it was a real elk steak. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. 
Yeah. So I had to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, I didn't, I can't tell you. It certainly tasted like a real elk steak. <laughs> it was the real one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we're going to get back into all of like, I'm going to aim at connecting this all into one thing of like <laughs> coffee inspiration, food inspiration, yeah. you know, music inspiration, science inspiration. Mm. I kind of, the, the whole concept of this podcast, like the word Kodawari is all about like, whatever it is you're doing, you do it with like that level of passion and dedication and aiming at the ideal kind of thing. Yeah. So that's going to be, that's going to be my aim, but let's get into a few trumpet things since that's what you do. <laughs> yep. These lips still work. I'm not yeah. sure how much how uh, longer they'll work, but yeah. <laughs> well, that's one of the scary things about trumpet, right? Yeah. It's, you take a day off and it's like, well, I guess I got to quit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I took yesterday off and I was just teaching today and I was like, huh, that doesn't feel great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> like I can definitely still play better than my students, but they don't, right. it doesn't feel great. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> So being in Canadian brass for 10 years, what what, mm-hmm. what what would you say is your favorite part about that? Was it the number of concerts? Was it just the the energy of like the, it's such a popular group or? Yeah, it's hard to p- pick one thing that was a favorite because it was really so outstanding. I mean, so it was amazing. And I should say the first things that are maybe as uh, the obvious ones, but like the players are amazing. And being able to play with amazing people that are the same people all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, I guess anyone that's in a great like ensemble orchestra or anything like that gets to experience that. But what was unusual and that's amazing, right? Yeah. But what's unusual is that they have, and and for a classical group, it's unusual at least that everywhere they go, everyone knows who they are. Their audience. I mean, yeah, like I had played plenty of concerts, but when the audience came, it was to see the piece or it was to see the conductor or, you know, it was never, unless it was, I was the soloist. It was really to see them. Yeah. And it's a different feeling when, and it took me a few years to really realize I'm like, they're coming to see us. Like they're not coming (laughs) to see the rep. It's really amazing. Yeah. And, and that was so, so um, I just completely foreign to me as a class. I just didn't expect that to happen as a classical player ever. Yeah. And I don't know if anyone should, I mean, it was so incredible. I mean, anywhere in the world and it was really special. And it felt like um, what I think a concert should always feel. And now I feel like I can do it whenever, even when it's an audience of strangers, um, is to focus on the fact that like they're there to have fun. And like, I, even if, though I knew that, yeah. it took really living that to feel like on stage, like I'm actually not just doing something that's selfish and it's not just about boosting my ego and it's not just about proving myself. All the things that are really strong feelings when you're on stage – yeah. Kind of got, they pushed aside, because, especially the Christmas concerts, because I actually didn't grow up with Christmas music. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I, mean, I was raised Christian, but I'm not Christian. And I just was not into it. I just never really liked it. And, and that was like a big, probably the most popular music that we do, even right. though that's not the bulk of what we do. But, and the audiences were so into it. And I just like, I, that's what I'm going to miss the most. Those Christmas concerts had such sure. a special sh- feeling. And it doesn't matter that you're not like playing a, a Mahler symphony with all the depth. Yeah. And it's like, well, the audience loves it. Like that's part of our job, right? Mm-hmm. They loved it. But I have to say the arrangements were always good. I, It was never like um, we were playing something that they loved that we hated. We okay. never did that. Yeah. And that uh, that was actually a relief because you never know, you know, what a group's vibe is. You know? Yeah. I think – there's this myth of selling out and I love it because when it comes down to it, I finally willing to admit like I would totally do it. I just don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. Like, I don't care. I'll play whatever. Just give it to me. You know, I can still play what I like. Yeah. But it just doesn't work. I mean, you have to be playing something you like and, and then you have to find the way Chuck described it is like concentric cir- circles. Like you got to find what you like and you got to find what they like. And then you play the stuff that overlaps. And then if right. they trust you and they like you, you could throw in something that you really like. You know, right. and, and and it could be the weirdest thing ever, and, and they're gonna dig it because it's like you're exposing something about yourself. Right. But it's really hard, <clears throat> you know, without establishing that rapport. So I think that that like rapport with audiences was really unusual. I'll probably never experience that again. Right? Yeah. When they trust you, you can take a risk and and program something and be like, you know, it's like when a TV show that you really love takes a risk on an episode and does something really wild, like. A, a one person almost monologue type like yeah. episode and it would never hold your attention if it's the first thing you saw from the show but since right. you respect it you're like we've been watching the show dark on netflix um Ooh. and it's like a german drama about actually you would love it it's all about like wormholes and time travel and I, i'll stop Ooh. speaking otherwise i'll spoil something <laughs> but 
it, oh. it got so difficult in season three, but because one and two were amazing, we're like uh, sticking with it. You know what I mean? There's a trust yeah. there that once yeah. once an audience trusts you, you can you can show them things that they weren't, you know, wasn't already easy for them to hear or, or watch or whatever. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. a great analogy. Yeah. Yeah, so I would definitely miss that and um I really want I I was really hoping you were going to spoil it for me, but all right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm happy to, but um I not nah, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> just have to watch it. It's amazing. I yeah, think. okay. It sounds cool. <laughs> It's deep though. I mean, it's like I, by deep, I mean like it, it kind of consumes your brain. So if you're busy, it, you might wait till like, you know, next time we're all in quarantine <laughs> and everything <laughs> shuts down. It's, yeah, maybe I should wait. Okay. Yeah. No, I just mean we actually stopped it after season two because it was like in the middle of like the chaos of the spr- this spring and we were just like, this is too much. Yeah. We got to take a, we just got to watch something like it's fluffy. Like, you know? Yeah, it consumed me. I was just talking about it all day, thinking about wow. it all day. Oh my and goodness. Uh, yeah. We're like, okay, we Thanks need to take a break. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. But it's a fun way to hear German. Like I love hearing, like watching shows in a different language and just letting oh, so some of it seep German. into yeah. your, your brain or whatever. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that reminds me of your last question. I mean, I, we went to Germany. That was the place we went the most by the far next oh, yeah? to, to States. And I, and I loved that. I mean, I never really learned German, but I loved the accent and like speaking what little things I knew. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I would love to know more of that, that show. And I'm also curious about your interest in science and you, when you were going through your physics, astrophysics stage, like where you were, where, what you were into and, and then what psychology stuff has been interesting you and and by the way you, are your interests always the same or are they always in sync you mean me and yanka here or yeah um I would i'll let her answer that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, we mostly definitely line up about thinking about psychology like consciousness i think we lined up on that phase i got into a lot about mind body stuff like how that connection works and you know just want to explore how mind can affect you know the body so I think in that sense, we lined up a lot. Yeah, we both found meditation mm-hmm. at the same time, too. I would say so, yeah. I, awesome. I was talking to my friend. Um, he's another trumpet player. And we were talking about, like, dating because he's single. And we were just saying how it's so hard to date once you really start meditating a lot because huh. you feel like something in you is waking up, like a different level of awareness. And he was just saying, like, the dating world is filled with people who are not meditating, basically, in his experience, at least. <laughs> so, like, it's very Wait, hard. I, I was, I would have guessed the opposite, but I don't know about for the for the females, but for the males, I I discovered meditation and found like I wasn't having any success unless I was like, oh shit, I've been meditating. I'm, <laughs> oh, I'm like, I see. too stuck in my own BS, and then I'd meditate and be like, now I'm cool again. Oh yeah. So yeah. I haven't no. been meditating, obviously, because I'm not being very cool. Right now. <laughs> That and playing the bass. I got to pick the bass back up. That'd yeah. be cool. You got to be a bass player that meditates. Then you can do whatever <laughs> oh. you want in the world. <laughs> I got chills just hearing you say that. <laughs> it's not even like the meditation itself, but I think it's having awareness over your thoughts. It's yeah. very important. You don't even so. have to do the action, but you should just have some sort of self-awareness. Yeah. Which people yeah. lack, so I think. Well, it's weird. I, yeah. I, th- I, I think it was somewhere around age 25 for me that I, I realized before that I didn't even have the distinction between just living out and acting out a thought and and being able to get ahead of it and see it and then decide what to do including getting nervous on stage you know yeah and and once you learn that there is a difference between being lost in a thought and seeing it from a different place you know everything changes so i think even if you don't practice meditation regularly once you know that shift you can at least know am i lost or did i just come back to being present you know and then you're constantly like, I'm here, now I'm lost and lost. And, oh, I'm back, you know. Yeah. Although <laughs> I think that's what I thought. That's what I and I think you're right, but then then having kids though, they are like all of the demons that you learn how to fight to fend off as a as somebody that gets better at it, right? It's a skill. Yeah are better at it than you have developed your skill unless you've been developing your skill. And because I right. re- and like tonight was an example of that. And that's why I was late. It's like, I lost that battle, sure. like <laughs> inwardly and outwardly. I and see. it was, and it was, and it was amazing. Cause like, even not even till like, you know, that he's asleep and I'm downstairs. I'm like, holy moly. I mean, like I was complete. I lost myself. I was not there. Yeah. And like, and then I was like, actually that happens a lot. 
because it's and that's what I think about like I think Eckhart Tolle brought it wasn't his quote but he brought it up in somewhere uh-huh. that like if you think you're, you know what actually it may not have been him it was some a teacher I had but he was like if you think if you think you've reached enlightenment like if you think you're getting there <laughs> go live with your parents oh <laughs> I've heard that one I forget who said it yeah yeah it's like, go, if you think you're enlightened go spend a week with your parents yeah right it's like <laughs> so real <laughs> So I, yeah. And, and, but I also, and then, so maybe I'm just saying that's a rational, you know, justify not you know, making having yourself feel better. Yeah. Friend. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, so here, so th- I think this is related, but I've been thinking about this because I found the subject fa- fascinating. And this was when I was going through my astrophysics kick as well, uh-huh. but it ties into kind of everything. Um, but are you familiar with Sean Carroll? He's a- Funny enough, I just listened to two podcast episodes today. Um, his podcast, Mindscape, and then the next one on my playlist queue was a different podcast where he was a guest. So I, I do know. Right, so Carroll. what episodes were they, and who was the host of the one where he was the guest? So the the one of Mindscape was um, Max Tegmark was on talking about. I think his book is called. Um, the, like his his thesis is something like math is the fundamental reality and um okay. i think he's called our universe is mathematics something like that but catchier right. and then the other one was cara santa maria's <laughs> podcast called talk nerdy oh i don't know that um sounds good that one i i phased in and out of but uh sean carroll was on twice and both times were pretty great she's just a good interviewer and she's um she's like a science communicator it's her primary yeah. thing but she awesome. she she always has good conversations. Um, yeah, what's your experience with Sean Carroll? So if you if you've read, well, I, I I came to know him at the Secret Science Club. Oh, he yeah. did a talk when he had come out with his one of his. It was actually his sec, uh, third book called The Big Picture, and I had never heard of him before. And I just would go to any of the events that seemed interesting to me. And, and, and he's a theoretical physicist, and and so I was like, all right, I love that. Those are, those are always my favorite sp- talks. And I so I yeah. went to his, and it it was literally like one of the most life-changing thing i've ever seen <laughs> so he it, it's a combination now that i know him better i don't know him at all but i know his work he's he's a very very good communicator and he's so convincing so yeah. and he knows his crap right he really knows what he's and he knows about. his philosophy too and he's he knows not his stuck. philosophy yeah oh, it <laughs> drives me crazy it's amazing yeah he is so i also went down a rabbit hole of watching him and i hope this isn't too this is gonna i'm gonna lose fans here but he has some talks about um stay with us lot, fans. Uh, yeah, Trust yeah. us. <laughs> <laughs> but he had some fans that um I'm sorry, he had some a couple of videos when I first started looking him up. When I when I read the book and I was like, I need to read everything he's ever done. Uh-huh. And I started digging into his other stuff. And there's a lot of debates he has, public debates of him like arguing with like very famous theists so convincingly uh-huh. that he was right. Because he's atheist and outwardly yeah. so, and he's a proponent of it and all that. I guess he's not really trying to convince anyone, but he's just he just yeah. thinks he's right. And I was completely convinced, and uh-huh. it changed it literally changed my life. And that's like a pretty big change to have. So yeah, so I I think about him a lot. But so to relate this back to how I think this <laughs> tangent relates to psychology and everything else existence itself maybe <laughs> is that one of and i'd be surprised if he didn't mention this in those two episodes that you heard him speak okay because in his most recent book um he he basically admits that he's a proponent of the everettian interpretation oh, of quantum mechanics many right? worlds yeah many worlds and like and i hadn't really heard about that and would just sort of go along with the 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 classic which he argues in the book actually makes no sense but the classical t- interpretation which is that the wave function when a quantum event happens once it's observed it collapses it collapses uh-huh. but his point is that it collapsing like what exactly does that mean that's not a very physicsy thing to say right where you've got two realities you're you're as you're a physicist here so you're saying you got two real things going on but by observing it one magically vanishes into thin air that doesn't really make any sense. Einstein right? was pissed at that too. <laughs> he was super pissed about that. Exactly. And he was and it's and it's amazing that he was just dismissed because he was old. They were like, ah, he's right. an old timer, he doesn't really get it. Meanwhile, anyway. Well, so, don't but, they call the, the the what you're describing the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum Copenhagen mechanics? Quantum the, mechanics. The, right. the nickname for that um is basically shut up and calculate. 
Exactly. It's and the like, thing don't philosophize about what this means. Just the equations work. Yeah. The computers we build from them work. Shut up and calculate. <laughs> right. And then, right, they're right. It does work. And, the, and, and it's, and it's actually in, in the way I think he opens the book, he says that, qu- you know, quantum mechanics basically ha- can explain every physical phenomenon that anyone has ever observed in the history of existence. <laughs> yeah. And we have no idea what the hell's going on, but <laughs> yeah, it works. Yeah. It, we, we know the math and there's no way it's wrong. The question is like, what's actually happening? So this idea for those listening that don't know what the heck we're talking about is that in an, in a quantum event in the Copenhagen interpretation, yeah, the wave function breaks down. And so like the famous ex- thought experiment, which was supposed to point out how ludicrous the whole thing was, is the cat in the box. Oh, Schrodinger's cat. Yeah. The Schrodinger's cat. And you've got a, uh, as a vial of cyanide and then you have a geiger counter which is a quantum you know clock that either is going to ob- observe some radio radioactive decay and break the vial and kill the cat releasing the cyanide killing the cat or not and right. if it's since it's a quantum event it's before it's observed according to the copenhagen interpretation both are true and so the cat is both alive and dead at the same time which is completely insane yeah. it makes no sense but um that's the outcome if you take buy into that interpretation so the right. everettian version says that for every branch of possibility so you've got this cat in the box yes the cat's both the cat's not both alive and dead at the same time but the minute that photons start interacting with the cat that's alive and the minute the photons start interacting with a cat that's dead they're pretty different scenarios the universe actually branches the entire right. universe and yeah. at first it's not too different from it- itself but of course, it's going to evolve differently because that one event, the cat being dead in one and the cat being alive in the other. But where this relates to existence is that <laughs> just on our bodies all the time, there are constant and like something like 12 a second. And that's just counting the like radioactive decay that's happening on the right. cells that are part of our body. And for every one of those 12 happening every second, the universe is branching. That's a lot of freaking branches. Right. And like. It's not that hard to conceive of a reality where something is totally different, like that maybe you guys have never met, for example. Right. Or that or this that talk has never happened. We actually do turn into zombies like we <laughs> hinted at <laughs> that earlier. We do. <laughs> so like, and hope, you know, I think that there's some, and I'm not an expert at this at all, but I think the assumption is that the laws of physics don't change. So it's not like um, you can be, I don't know. You well, it's not like the speed, like the gravitational force will be different in the different worlds. But although in Max Tegmark, that that MIT mathematician, physicist guy, his he, he basically says there are different levels of the multiverse. Okay. And one model or model, you know, like they're just different hypotheses about what this many worlds interpretation could mean, multiple universe things. And one of them is that there is no reason that the <coughs> laws of physics have to be what they are. There are certain things that have to be like in this universe, but other constants could be different and laws of physics could be different in a different universe. Right. It doesn't mean that complex life will form or, you know, complex carbon chains will be stable or anything like that and consciousness and all of what we seem to care about. But it could be, it could just be a, I mean, that's even more terrifying to me that there could be infinite universes of just like the lights are out. Yeah, and that's probably the higher probability if there are many, if there are multi, multiple universes, that's probably the case for most yeah. of them. Yeah. I mean, and what's that famous um, Carl Sagan quote? We are, you know, a way for the universe to know itself. How many universes have evolved the complexity where, where consciousness turns on and then looks back at itself and its yeah. context and all of that? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have an answer. (laughs) Yeah, I don't think anyone does. (laughs) Yeah, luckily. But that's what fascinated me about consciousness and kind of connected the astrophysics to psychology of consciousness is that the best definition of consciousness they have right now is what it is like to be you. Like first person subjective experience. There's like this impassable gap between, look at all the connections between brain and behavior. But still, when when I hear music, just to bring it to music here, when I hear the sound of a trumpet, you could look at what parts of my head are lighting up under a scanner, but that's not the sound of a trumpet, right? There's always this um, experiential gap that I don't know if like epistemologically you could never close it, but it seems impassable right, right now. It, cer- it certainly does because then you could, you know, and I'm curious where you lie on the spectrum, but, you know, 
is it Chalmers? Is that his name? David says, Chalmers, yeah. Char- yeah, he talks about there's the easy problem and the hard problem. Yes, yeah. And so the easy problem is like, well, yeah, you know, who knows? Maybe the way you guys interpret redness, you know, is not the same as the way I do. And maybe it doesn't matter because we're able to agree enough that, it, you know, we can exist. But that is yeah. consciousness too. But then there's also the like, what makes you up as a human being? And, um, but I, if you haven't seen Sean Carroll's counter argument, I don't have it internalized enough to, to bring it up, uh-huh. but it's worth checking out. Cause I, I was like convinced. And there's also Sean Carroll has had traumas on his podcast. Oh yeah. Nice. And it's pretty amazing because he doesn't believe that there's anything such as free will. Um, Chalmers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he, so Sean Carroll does believe in free will. And in fact, his argument does. for free will is the one that kind of shifted me away from you don't have free will. So um, for people listening, there is a concept called determinism, which is the these laws of physics that we were talking about the from the Big Bang up until now. If you could have all the information in the system, you could predict everything. You could predict exactly how I'm, I'm going to finish the sentence. You could predict every position of every electron and quark. And, and, you know, obviously we could never calculate that on anything close to what we have. But the idea that you could calculate it is the idea that the laws of physics are just running out the process and everything is determined. Not in like a, I was destined to meet Yanka kind of way. <laughs> But at the same time, in that way, you know? Kind of, yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it was always going to happen, right? right? And so where is free will within that framework, right? How could how could I say the sentence I could have done otherwise when, I mean, that just doesn't make sense, right? Right. So, so that's what, what the Chalmers Sean- and like Sam Harris and, and those kinds of thinkers, that's their free against free will thing. But Sean Carroll says, well... Is temperature real? And like the point <laughs> is to say yes. It's like, well, temperature doesn't exist. Temperature is an emergent phenomena. Right. Temperature of, of one atom does not exist. It's something when you average the energy of, of many, many, many atoms. So we all agree on the utility and the reality of temperature and the predictive, predictive power in science of temperature, um, but it's not really real in base reality when you go down to the level of up quarks, down quarks, and electrons, right? So free will is this agreed upon emergent phenomena that we behave as if it exists. Therefore, it exists, it exists right? <laughs> I mean, that, that is his argument, though. And, and, and at first I was like, oh, what? But then I really right. sat with it. And um, I, we just did a, a podcast. The previous episode was Game of Thrones philosophy talking about honor. And I found the Steven Pinker definition of honor, which was, we all believe that we all, be- we all act as if we all believe that we all believe in honor. Like, it's, <laughs> you can't amazing. hold it, right? But right. if I believe that you believe in it, I'll believe in it and vice versa, right. you know? Right. It's the same with money, sadly enough. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's literally going to, that's one of the speaking of what's going to happen when everybody realizes all, that is the one I'm actually the most worried about, but that's for another podcast, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think, but what I love that Sean Carroll does is he takes that to anything and, you know, you could take that and literally apply it to anything, to consciousness itself mm-hmm. as an emergent pr- uh, pro- uh, phenomenon. Right. But um, but even just what I love that he describes himself is is a naturalist, but a uh, a poetic naturalist. Mm, yeah. So that he's he does believe there's a physical world. He believes that everything is physical. There's nothing separate from a physical world, and that anything that it comes across as spiritual or or you know conscious or not, yeah, is emergent from that. And but the poetic side says just because a chair isn't real doesn't mean that we can't still call it a chair. It would be pretty inconvenient right. to describe the bazillion atoms and whatever you do, or interacting fields that are making up this emergent phenomenon of a chair that is right. very functional to talk about on the human scale. And so therefore, yeah, it's real. You know, right. It's a real thing. Just because it's not fundamental doesn't mean it's not real. Right. And therefore, consciousness is real and free will is real and humans are real and the 
future right. is real, you know, or it will be real. But the, the David Chalmers response to that with consciousness is that you have two different kinds of emergence. I think that you call it like soft emergence and hard emergence. So the hard emergence would be like consciousness where you, you don't know how to reduce it down to the constituent parts. Whereas a chair, we do know how to, we, we can just look at the atoms that make it up and say, yeah, we understand why sitting on this stool I'm on right now works because I have electrons in my butt that are repelled by the electrons in the chair and I'm actually hovering slightly above the stool. Whereas with consciousness, right. you get to a point where you have to make an epistemological jump that to, you know, from brain firings and such to subjective experience. So that's the part I find fascinating, especially listening to music. It's like when you just listen right. to a Bach cantata and you're sitting there and you're like, how is this working? There's an experience that most of it I'm not in charge of. It's just hitting me less than I am yeah. like building it, you know? Right. Yeah. So I think that's a, yeah, <laughs> I was ready to, to argue something that I really don't know much about. And so then you brought up the music. I'm like, yeah, damn it. Yeah, I guess you're right. <laughs> and I'm not sure. I mean, I'm not, I just love listening to these leaders in the field, f you know, disagree with each other and be like, all right, yeah, we just don't agree. Well, I, I think end. it's a good thing because as yeah. for me, when I hear these things, I find myself being like, oh, that's a pretty good point. I'm on his side. And then yeah. the other one talks. I'm like, actually, that's a pretty yeah. good point. I'm now on this side. You know? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. So one of the things I really like about living in Ithaca, why, well, and I guess this would be true in any college town, but it's so different from what it was like living in New York City, at mm -hmm. least where I was. And I loved where I lived. But, um, but everyone I live with is is professors in something else like the, oh, the sure. philosopher I live and one of my neighbors and this is he's like like the, the person I'm always excited to see the most just because I love to talk about the subject he's an expert in is is a theoretical physicist oh perfect and <laughs> yeah and Liam McAllister and he's you know pretty famous because there's not that many of them and he's but anyway he's a string theorist and so like we and we talk about Sean Carroll a lot because they're friends and they've written a paper they've written papers oh, wow. together and it's amazing to get his perspective because he's I don't know. Not only does he, I'm not, am I not convinced if he buys into the Everettian idea? Yeah. And, and I haven't even talked about how, what he thinks about how it relates to, you know, these emergent phenomena like a steepest consciousness and stuff like yeah. that. But I'd love to. Um, and it's like, but, what are but, you going to argue? Like, uh, no, many worlds yeah. is right. It's like, how deep down <laughs> can you go? Like, <laughs> but that's what I realized. I'm like, wow, I'm really, I've really been brainwashed by Sean Carroll because uh -huh. he's so committed. And then we were sort of joking about how, how he is just so, he just speaks in a way that's very compelling. Yes. I mean, and he doesn't throw out any of the baby with the bathwater of religion. I think he does a no. good job of keeping mystery, no. but not um, being tethered to you know, like I think some, a lot of even scientists can't untether themselves from religion. Um, and I've heard good arguments for that. Like, of course you go, okay, what do you mean by God? It's like, okay, they might mean something totally different than what you initially thought. Right. So there are, there are plenty of scientific ways to use that word, God, you know? Right. Um, but yeah, I agree. Sean Carroll is such a consistent he has such a consistent, consistent. worldview and he doesn't exactly. get rid of any of the complexity because he always talks about emergence and stuff. Right. Right. And in a way that's not cheating because it's easy to abuse that word. Yes. Yeah, totally. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, as a musician, like most of what we care about when we listen to music is emerging, right? It's, 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 it's not, yeah, it's all emergent. It's all emergent. It's not like you go, Whoa, look at that note. You know, right. I mean, sometimes you do, and that's great. It's like that. Yeah, but a even flat. that's emergent. <laughs> but yeah, what is yeah. that? What is an A flat? It's an emergent thing that you built. It's actually many, many frequencies at once that you're just averaging out to one sound in your head. It's filled with all these overtones. You know, right. so it, it's it's like um, what's the expression? Turtles all the way down. You know, <laughs> like, <laughs> I haven't heard it. I don't think I get it. Oh, it's like a. a <laughs> Uh, I never heard of it. <laughs> this whole it's yeah. just the, the Eastern philosophy way to say infinite regression. Like you could. Oh, just, I see. Cool. So it, the the original argument goes like this: um, an old lady went to a astrophysics, um, you know, talk or whatever, and then at the end she goes up to the professor and says, "You know, your theory is wrong. You know, um, it's actually the fact that the Earth is on the back of a turtle." And the old physics professor laughed and said, that's, that's cute. Like, so what, what is that turtle on? And she's like, oh, it's a bigger turtle. 
And then he goes, what about that turtle? And she goes, it's another turtle. And then he, and then he goes, and that one, she's like, you're not getting it. It's turtles all the way down. (laughs) (laughs) But I use that expression now. Anytime you're like bumping into some knowledge and you go, all right, I got to shut that door and just (laughs) exist on, like I'm playing the trumpet right now. Stop thinking about physics. Right. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) Yeah. All right, thanks for listening to this episode of Exploring Kodawari. If you enjoyed it, we hope you'll consider sharing it on social media and with friends. You can also help us out by leaving a rating and a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Those help us more than you would think. And if you'd like to help us out in a more substantial way, consider going over to our website to make a donation through PayPal. Links are in the episode notes for this. You can do this as a one-time donation or a recurring monthly donation. All of that support will help us to set aside time in order to create content for the podcast and the blog. And finally, please get in touch with us and say hi, either on social media or privately through email. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.